Welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast, a podcast where we dig into the fascinating issues, conditions, and quandaries in the massage and manual therapy world today. I'm Whitney Lowe. And I'm Tel Luca. Welcome, welcome to, to the, the Thinking, Thinking Practitioner. Practitioner. And welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast, where Books of Discovery has been part of the massage therapy and bodywork world for over 25 years, and nearly 3,000 schools around the globe teach with their textbooks, e-textbooks, and digital resources. Books of Discovery likes to say learning adventures start here, and they find that same spirit here on the Thinking Practitioner podcast and are proud to support our work, knowing that we share the mission to bring the massage and bodywork community thought-provoking and enlivening content that advances our profession. Instructors of manual therapy education programs can request complimentary copies of Books of Discovery's textbooks to review for use in their programs. Please reach out at booksofdiscovery.com. Listeners can explore their collection of learning resources for anatomy, pathology, kinesiology, physiology, ethics, and business mastery at booksofdiscovery.com, where thinking practitioners like you save 15% by entering thinking at checkout. And I am looking forward to our conversation today. I'll introduce our very special guests in a minute. But first, I want to just give the context so after being diagnosed with breast cancer in 2012, my wife, Loretta, has been living with breast cancer now for 11 years. And so I keep a pretty close eye on what's happening out in the cancer and massage world in particular, cancer, massage, body work. And there were two things that came across my radar in the past couple of years that really caught my eye. And in both cases, the researcher's unambiguous recommendation was don't massage. So I'm hoping our, like I said, very esteemed guests can help us put these studies into context and figure it's a great chance to review the history of this question as well. And we would like to welcome our first guest, Kathy Ryan, who's a registered massage therapist practicing in Canada and actively highly regarded continuing education teacher and conference presenter, especially in the areas of scar tissue management. And you'll remember we had Kathy on our podcast previously in episode 42, uh, and also uh, involved with myofascial pain and dysfunction. So she's also authored works, including co-authoring Oncology Massage, an Integrative Approach to Cancer Care for Manual Therapists, also from uh, Jessica Kingsley Publishers. So welcome back to the Thinking Practitioner podcast, Kathy. Great to have you again. Thanks, Whitney. And just a quick correction there. I didn't co-author Integrative uh, Oncology Massage, but I am a chapter contributor to that. I okay, co-authored, great, great. Thanks for that. I co-authored Scar Tissue Management with Kim. Yeah. Nancy, Nancy King Smith. Okay. Great. Thank Thanks you. For that. And Erica Sokom, you're an oncology massage therapist working at a major East Coast cancer center, which is ranked in the top five cancer centers in the country, but which we didn't have time to get approval to actually name here. So you've taught intensive uh, oncology massage workshops with Tracy Walton, who we can name very uh very honored to be able to do so, who is a pioneer in massage therapy and cancer. You've taught with her all over the country since 2011. Thanks for taking the time to be with us, Erica. Sure, thank you. All right, so to start out, before we get into those uh, studies I mentioned, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us your views about how recommendations on massage and cancer have changed over the years, because context for myself, back in the 80s, early 80s, when I was being trained, we were just told flat out, don't massage people with cancer because there's a risk of metastasis and we never know if we're spreading it. And that blanket recommendation has definitely evolved since then. And I know it's uh, a subject of lots of great work and discussion and deep thinking. So what are the current attitudes, would you say, toward working with people with cancer? Erica, would you mind starting us off on that? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, as we know, we've come a long way. Um, I think that it's pretty fair to say that the, you know, as you said, that the blanket recommendation of no massage was didn't really leave any room for any nuance at all in our work. And, um, you know, massage is a great many things. <laughs> And um, I think it's been really important and a wonderful practice that we've developed over all of these years with all these wonderful big brainy thinkers, you know, to really sort of pick apart what are the arguments here? What is it about cancer? What is it about metastasis? What is it about massage therapy um, that really um, 
may be a risk factor if it is. And I think that, you know, where we came from, which is this sort of blanket rule of, of if someone has cancer, don't massage them, is really much, much more um, colorful now, you know, and also just has so much more room for um, question and discussion. And I think, you know, really where we came to with that is, um, you know, not to oversimplify this, but, you know, in all of the stages of metastasis, which is still being uncovered all the time in medicine, um, a lot of what we've come to is is don't massage a tumor site, right? Mm -hmm. Don't disturb um, what we know to be an active tumor site. Um, and how do we find that out? I think that's really, you know, where the detail comes in, right? Um, what questions do we ask? How do we know what questions to ask? You know, and this is a lot of what we teach in our classes is, um, you know, the fact-finding mission um, of being able to really have a good conversation and uncover the details that we need to and the information that we need to in order to work safely with someone. And that's incredibly important. And um, I don't get the question very often anymore um, from clients or patients of, you know, geez, well, will massage therapy spread my cancer? But it does happen still. Um, and I kind of love that question because gosh, you know, I don't want someone to come on my table just sort of blindly accepting that it's going to be okay, you know what you're doing sort of thing, but really kind of get into um, why we um, why we think, you know, massage therapy is safe if applied correctly, right? And asking the right questions, right? So, um, so we've really come quite a long way um, in our thinking. And, and it's, you know, again, our, our, big takeaway is we don't massage tumors. We don't massage areas of active cancer. I know there's probably a whole lot more to it than that, this question of how we keep it safe. Mm -hmm. But that is, that's a pretty key point, I think, that we want to unpack is we don't massage tumors. And you say when, the, when it, you said sometimes it happens, you're saying the question still comes up sometimes, just to clarify that. Sometimes the question still comes up, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. I don't get it very often, I have to say, um, but every now and then um, someone will ask. We would. And it, please fill me in, and Kathy, jump in too if you'd like, but uh, fill me in. But my impression is there's a substantial body of evidence that there's benefit from massage during cancer treatment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is a growing body of research that certainly suggests there are, um, particularly in the areas of um, pain and depression still to this point. Um, but certainly, I mean, I know, Kathy, I'm sure you can <laughs> jump in on on all of the ways in which we hear from our patients and our clients um, the way that it, it benefits them. Um, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, side effects, you know, symptom management, side effect management um, of cancer itself, but also you know, the treatments come with uh, a whole host of, of potential side effects and and really being able to um, to help alleviate some of that is is certainly part of the joy in my work. I'll just jump I, in again, just speaking to the little bit of the historical context. Uh, to like you, I did my original training back in the 80s. And certainly that was the prevailing mindset was that we just do not touch anybody with cancer, period, like that blanket perspective. So the first person that I'm aware of that really challenged that in a significant way is one of the iconic Canadian massage therapy educators, Deborah Curtis. She is the first one that I am aware of that really came out swinging, uh, you know, and really I think Deborah was one of, for me, one of the first individuals to really be what I would describe as an evidence-informed educator. You know, this was kind of what she was known for here in Canada. And she wrote an article back in the 1990s, you know, picking apart what we knew at the time about, uh, you know, what was understood about how cancer spreads and what we understood at the time, what was essentially, you know, potentially what we are capable of with our hands and how those two things intersect. So that's really kind of where, you know, historically, um, my mind started to shift around that was very much rooted in Deborah. And then, of course, uh, Gail McDonald around the same time was starting her process of oncology education. And then uh, Tracy pretty much right on the heels of that as well. Tracy Walton. Mm -hmm. and then, so, all, you know, it all really pioneers is. pioneers in that shift, that paradigm shift. 
Exactly, to- exactly. And just to speak to, you know, uh, the benefit of massage therapy yeah. for people who are living with cancer, people going through various types of cancer-related therapies, you know, and I think really two of the most robust areas of research for massage therapy are in pain management, um, and as well as uh, just, a, you know, a mood, anxiety, depression, you know, those are kind of the areas that there's a lot of research to support how massage therapy can be a benefit to people. And uh, the Society for Oncology Massage is one of those organizations that is a, is a good hub for the more current research, as well as the Whitney mentioned Oncology Massage and Integrative Approach to Cancer Care, which was co-authored by Janet Penning and Rebecca Sturgeon uh, from HealWell. Uh, also a well, more current res- a, resource. Yeah, we have guests on the show here. Right. We'll link to those two things you just mentioned in the show notes as well. You know, one of the things that um, I know that I hear a lot from practitioners as a, as a concern when we say, you know, don't massage active tumor sites, um, everybody's kind of like, that's kind of a no-brainer. That certainly does make sense. But then the question always comes up, well, how do I know if somebody has potential metastasis? How do I really know what might be an active site? Um, thoughts on that in terms of, you know, how we manage that? I, I think Erica brought up a really important point, and it really emphasizes the importance of a thorough health history, you know, the first time that we're seeing someone to see if we can sort of see any kind of red flags that might lead us into a direction that needs further investigation. And I think it also, for me, emphasizes something that I beat a drum a lot about here in Canada, is the need for um, what I would describe as uh, advanced practice, education, and training in certain complex areas of care, oncology being one of them, and and not to in any way devalue those educators like Tracy Walton, who is doing a phenomenal job of and her associates of of educating people or Gail or Heal Well, um, but I think we need something that is more standardized. We need some kind of valid accreditation process that doesn't exist. So there are individuals out there who are certifying people, but there's no, let's say, third party that's ensuring that certain standards are being met. Yeah. That is a that's a rampant issue, I think, everywhere in, in terms of a lot of these areas of, of specialized care for people with, with healthcare complaints. Even here in it's, Canada, considered kind of the Shangri-La of massage therapy education and training where we have re- really rigorous standards, I still really strong believe that there's a need for that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, having some foundational oncology massages is uh, really vital, and particularly because, I mean, you you can't not see someone that has a history, at least, of cancer. I mean, um, there's so, so, so many people that will walk into our doors, will have a history of cancer, um, maybe active cancer as well. And um, and knowing what to do, um, even if you're not intensely trained, I think getting some foundational um, education around, okay, well, what can I do safely in this mm-hmm. case? And then once we have, you know, then we can refer them to someone else who has more training and can work with them a little bit differently, or we get our training ourselves and then they can come back, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think that... Um, Yeah, I I would love to see that. I would love to see that. I think when it comes to um, not knowing, that's always the concern, right? Is we coming back to this question of, you know, well, what if we don't know? What if the person doesn't know um, if they have an area of metastasis, for example? And I think this is an incredibly important conversation. I think it's um, really at the crux of some of these, this this research that we're going to be talking about, these studies that we're going to talk about too, is, um, yeah, well, wh- the big question for me is when do we refer? When do we um, bring mm-hmm. in, um, you know, a medical voice if we need to or or, um, or need more information before we work? Um, and I think um, I think that's a problem across massage therapists in general, not just in this sort of cancer realm, but um, when do we refer to other clinicians and, um, and practitioners? And I think that... Um, you know, we talk about pain, reports of new pain. Is it nervy pain? Is it, you know, we kind of, we ask them to describe, you know, um, 
what they're really going through to see if we can kind of suss out a little bit further. Is this sound like the old injury from, you know, 1978 football, whatever, or is this something different? Um, you know, kind of trying to get information. Um, some of this, um, to be honest with you, I think like we all have quite a lot of experience um, and we've heard many, many things. So some of it comes with experience. Um, and in lieu of experience or extra training, how do we respond? Um, what do we so do? This, you're saying there's a role for experience, there's a role for training, there's a role for careful histories, there's a role for careful monitoring of what's happening and the symptoms that are arising during the treatment. Let's do uh, talk about those studies some, because that, in some ways this is one of the key questions in our understanding of them. First study, uh, well, let me just say too, before we get into the studies, my wife really does benefit quite a bit from hands-on work in her now 11-year process, and both from me and from uh, uh, lymphatic practitioners. Mm -hmm. And I'm just remembering that at one point she said, hey, you're working with my lymph. Couldn't you be spreading my metastasis around? And her practitioner says, no. No, you need the lymph to move. That's what helps deal with the cancer. That was the quick answer that for the client-facing Inter, inter, you know, interaction that happened there. And it, it reassured my wife. She's watching this very closely, though, as we are having this discussion, of course. Okay, so these studies that make us, make me want to think harder about it and talk more about it. First one from Peter Friedel uh, at the Fascial Research Congress in Montreal, 2022. It's unpublished work. Dr. Friedel actually responded to my requests for a conversation here with him about it really quickly. He's willing to come talk. However, the work he presented at that Congress hasn't been published, and he wants to wait till it's published later in the year. And maybe we'll get him to circle back around to comment on some of the things we talk about today. But his, his presentation at the Fascial Research Congress, you were there, Whitney, showed live mouse tissue being with pigmented tumor cells in it. He was massaging the tissue with a probe, and you could visually see the pigmented tumor cells being pushed out or migrating out into the extracellular channels around the tumor. And his recommendation on the slide that came up there right after showing us that, don't massage tumors. Did I summarize that more or less fairly, Whitney? Yeah, that's kind of what, what I got out of there too. And then I know for me, there was a couple of questions that came up out of that which there always is with, with research right. in particular. Yeah, I was we were like, yeah. what? Wait a minute. There's lots of questions, which I want to unpack and go through. And I want to also just, out, yeah, yeah it, you said like that was right before lunch and over lunch, everyone was like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, how, you know, what's he, yeah. you know, how dare he say this without, you know, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair to him, I'm sure I'm oversimplifying his research as well. Yeah. And his ways, if yeah. we got to just acknowledge that. I think there was... A question that came up for me, if I remember, and this has been, you know, a couple of years now, so it's it's a little fuzzy in my memory. But uh -huh. one of the things that did come up for me as a question at that point was it looked as if he was able to sort of massage those tumor sites with a very, very fine instrument or probe or something like that to get very specific pressure in that area or something like that. And um, my question was mm -hmm. like, does that translate into the very broad-based applications of pressure that would be done during massage, and would that have the same effect on there? Yeah. Well, let's let's go let's go through those questions. What questions come up in your minds, Erica and Kathy? Well, for me, initially, anytime I see a study like this, my first question always is: Were massage therapists um, was there any involvement of massage therapists in the research study design? So, because for me, the question that always comes up is what kind of pressure, how much pressure, you know, is it any pressure at all, you know, or does there have to be a certain amount of pressure? And as Whitney brought up, does that pressure have to be very point specific? Or if there's pressure around the area, does that also produce this kind of same kind of result? So for me, that's always the first question that I have when I'm trying to critically evaluate research, because I think it is important to, for me to, to not go to the extremes of completely dismissing it because it doesn't align with my understanding or my beliefs or the mm -hmm. other side of the coin that, I, you know, all in. Absolutely. You know, it's part mm -hmm. of picking that apart and critically evaluating, you know, 
you know, what in what context is this important for me to know as a practitioner? So that's mm-hmm. that's always the first question for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I would I mean, I would absolutely absolutely right on that one. It does it it really again it, it goes back to the nuance of what our work is. You know, um I I work differently than Kathy, than Till, than Whitney. I mean, we all work differently. Um, so what is it about uh, the massage that is contraindicated or needs to be adjusted in some way? Not just all of massage. What is it specifically about massage? And as Kathy said, you know, it's sight, it's pressure, it's, um, you know, how much pressure, that kind of thing. And and um, I sort of, you know, the, you know, the reaction I, I typically get from one of these, you know, something that comes out too is always my first reaction is always like, oh man, you know, we're going back again. And then, you know, I, with this in particular, I was like, you know, I had to, I read through, you know, this other study a couple of times. I looked at this video and, and in a way it's actually kind of validating for what we're already doing. You know, when it says don't massage a tumor, we're not massaging tumors. And to, to your point, you know, Earlier, um, we probably didn't have to have extra training to know that we don't massage tumors. Um, but that's essentially what I took. Um, one of the big takeaways here was we don't massage tumors and, and that remains. So I'm not sure necessarily if some of these things change what we're going to be doing in oncology massage therapy as a practice, because that is tenant number one <laughs> in oncology massage therapy. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's, of course, my mind got busy after seeing this presentation on looking for the chinks I could get in with my biases and beliefs. <laughs> and uh, like some of the, I'll just narrate some of them to you. For yeah. sure, we don't knowingly massage tumors. Yeah. And even unknowingly, we don't know the directionality of what we're doing in relationship to the tumor. If the tumor is unknown, we don't know if we're massaging toward the tumor or away from the tumor. What is research shows very careful, specific scraping away from the tumor did ma- did passively migrate some of the pigmented cells out of the matrix. What what's to say that uh, going toward the tumor doesn't slow the progression of cancer as well? Mm-hmm. So you just say rationally or mathematically, the odds could be uh, even that we're accelerating or slowing down cancer. Who knows? Unless that study that's actually been studied, we don't know that it doesn't slow down cancer. There's not a benefit toward massaging, toward tumors. Anyway, that's, again, that's my, like, you know, uh, rational mind looking for arguments to have with him. So hopefully I'll get to have that discussion with him at some point too. Mm -hmm. I can just make a quick point too. Like, I think that there is, there's this question of rate of metastasis or like speeding up the process. Okay. And there's a question of encouraging metastasis. And I think they're actually very different. So when it comes to Urging metastasis, that is tumor, me, pressure, directly applied. That That's what that feels with. And, and I feel like, too, by the way, I also want to add not just my mechanical pressure with my hands, but um, joint movement as well can also affect or potentially dislodge or, you know, encourage cell movement or whatever from this tumor, right? Um, so there's there's that piece. But then, then it's the movement of those cells. So we know that cells are constantly sort of shedding off of the primary tumor site. Whether we press there or we don't, it's happening all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many, many of those cells, millions of those cells, they're getting killed off by the body's own immune system as it passes through our blood and our lymph, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, I think that's really important to, to note that first of all, those two distinctions. And then, you know, I think the question back when Deborah Curtis was writing that article was, can we actually speed that process up? If we're massaging someone, does that mean we're A, increasing blood and lymph flow? Which I think jury really is still out on that. I don't think we have a lot of sort of data about systemic increases in blood and lymph flow. Um, We know that compared to exercise, no, for example. Exactly, right. And so thank you for making that point because... Yes. So can we as massage therapists speed up the rate? And also does that matter? So mm. even if we, if we're speeding up the rate of which those cells are moving around the body, does that mean that it's going to plant somewhere quicker? You know, I'm not, I don't think so. I'm not it's, sure. Right. Um, yeah. but, but then also to your point, patients are 
often, almost always told, please move as much as you're able to. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. some people are still running 12 miles. Some people are on the couch, right? So what what does that variation look like? But But they're increasing their blood and lymph flow by moving their bodies and they're encouraged by their medical teams to move their bodies. So if we take this to the logical extreme, does that mean we shouldn't do mammograms because they also involve pressure? Does that mean that we shouldn't be sitting on places that might have a tumor? Does that mean we shouldn't be lying on them? Because basically to be, again, I'm probably being unfair to his conclusions, but his uh, recommendation was pressure can uh, passively move tumor cells. That's his basic takeaway. So does that mean we should just leave people on a couch or on bed forever and not move? So we don't and there also pressure from that chair or that bed or that couch. There you go. Right? Okay. So, I mean, I have a patient that I work with almost weekly. She has bone metastases kind of all over. Um, and she, I give her an exceedingly gentle massage. I am not disturbing anything. I'm, the tissue is not moving. And she gets a wonderful relaxing massage. And sometimes I have this thought of like, I'm putting less pressure on her body than the back of a chair would, right? Yeah. So, um, or, you know, people hug each other without thinking about it. You know, are you giving someone a hug and then, right? So I, I feel like there's, we we focus in so much on massage pressure and, and uh -huh. touch, but there is so many other things that we do in our lives that include more firm touch than, than a massage sometimes, right? Let's talk about the second study too, if you're ready. Yeah. This was- before, Till before go we ahead, go jump ahead, there, can yeah, I sure. just one more quick question before we get to that? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go back to this effects thing for just a second because, you know, Till, as you mentioned, there's there's been kind of studies that have indicated that the blanket statement that we many of us were taught back in the 80s of massage increases blood flow, you know, has not really been borne out in terms of systemic blood flow increase. But there is certainly suggestion that soft tissue manipulation may encourage superficial increases in like let's say capillary perfusion or something like that at the surface level and i know some of the concerns about metastasis or spreading it has been not so much about pressure but about increased blood flow what about i'm just curious to hear your thoughts about something when we think along the lines like well maybe that's not going to impact a deeper tumor so much but maybe what about something like skin cancer where there would be an increase in superficial perfusion of blood uh, through the skin. Does that come up in any concerns or discussions about some of these possibilities? Well, I think when you talk about the whole concept of flow, I mean, I, oftentimes we're thinking about lymphatics and, and blood vascular. Mm -hmm. And whether, you know, stuff is going to flow through our body, you know, just by virtue of breathing. If stuff doesn't flow through our body, we cease to exist. So it is going to flow. And I think this kind of goes back to the root of some of Deborah, Deborah's, Purdy's early arguments about, you know, should people with cancer not exercise, go up a flight of stairs, do anything that would increase flow, have an orgasm, all these things that we do as human beings, you know, should we stop doing living, <laughs> essentially, you know, so, there, so there's that point, I think, to be made. Um, you know, there's my understanding of metastases is there is the movement or shedding of cells, and then there is the state of the environment of where that cell goes to in order for, you know, a tumor to start to form or take hold. There has to be a certain thing going on in that distant environment in order to support the development of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think these are some of the really important questions about that are still unanswered in, in cancer research about, you know, all of those things that have to happen in concert in order for something to move and then establish itself. And certainly we saw um, at the Fascia Congress in Ber Berlin, Dr. Neil Thies is uh, talking about the interstitium, the new, the new system or tissue and talking about they had discovered cracks in the interstitium. And at first they thought they were artifact, but actually these cracks allow for the movement of fluid to move from one space to another space, and that the flow channels in the interstitium, uh, essentially that is your pre-lymph, and at some point that flow channel aligns with the lymphatic vessel, and that's how eventually flow goes into the vessel. Um, so, 
you know, there is that potential for stuff to move throughout the body by a variety of means, mechanical pressure being one of them, movement being another, breathing being another, muscle contraction being another, and as well, you know, the other physiologically driven things that are low. But on the other mm -hmm. end, there has to be something that allows for that tumor to be able to establish itself. Good, thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. All right, our second study, CARDA et al., a team out of Indonesia, doing a very interesting design study, massage, manipulation, and progression of osteosarcoma. Does it really correlate? Again, they, to be fair to them, they put that question right in the title of their study. And they studied, um, again, I'm going to grossly oversimplify the study, so I'll put it in the show notes so you can go read it yourself. They studied uh, patients at a large hospital in Jakarta who over time were dealing with osteosarcoma. They did uh, self-reported, did you get massage or not, and part of your medical record or not, and divided their cohort into two groups, those that got massage while they had treatment for osteosarcoma and those that didn't. And then they did some careful comparison of the two groups, those getting massage, those who didn't, to see was there a benefit or was there a risk involved. And their findings were that those who received the massage therapy that was available to their, them there had an increased in earlier metastasis risk and a lower five-year survival rate. Okay, mm -hmm. did I? How did I do summarizing that? With what do you think? Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds accurate there. All right. So, how do you think we should contextualize this one, Kathy? You want to start us off? Yeah, you know, I think it's some of the same points that we've already talked about is, you know, again, for me, when I see research about massage, I want to know, was there any involvement of massage therapists in the research design, first and foremost? Because I think it's important that the context of what we do and how we do it be considered in, in the design. Secondly would be is when we see that overriding M word, massage, those of us who practice within the field of manual therapy knows that that can mean many things. You know, and for me, I kind of, uh, one of my go-tos is uh, Sandy Fritz's book, The Fundamentals of Massage, and she has a chapter in there that she did with Leon Chetow where they talk about, and I know it's not exactly called this, but the concept of it is therapeutic loading, where they talk about the different ways that we can engage tissue. We can stretch it or tension it. We can compress it. We can shear it. And mm. that apparently the different way that we engage tissue produces different outcomes. You know, my classic example in the scar tissue work that I do is uh, Langevin's work seems to imply that fibroblasts have an affinity for stretching or tensioning types of engagement, whereas based on Carla Stecco's work, fascicides have an affinity for shearing types of methods or engagement. And those produce different types of results. So I think when we're going forward, for me, studies like this, I think, really is an encouragement to get more detailed in the research. When we're doing research about massage, I think it's important to identify what is the mechanism or what is the way that we're engaging the tissue and what are the potential implications of that. Yeah, yep. they, it's, that's a great point. Bef Erica, before I... Uh, check in with you just to say this the type of massage was unspecified in this study and it was interestingly and it was it was basically happening in the wild or in people's daily lives and they made the point that many people there in their cohort would because of socioeconomic or availability questions delay conventional treatment and address it first with traditional methods which indonesian massage wasn't specified or described what was available to them there. If I do a quick Google search of Indonesian massage, I get several things, but they, the common element seems to be pressure with the thumbs and a circular motion along energy pathways. But there's probably, again, many different things people were getting, but that mm -hmm. seems to be at least what's been made it to the internet about, inter, about uh, Indonesian massage. So we're guessing, but we don't really know. What do you think? Erica, what would you have to say about this study? What do you think about yeah, this? Yeah, um, again, I think the you know the methods being not research methods, but the method of massage therapy and how it was applied is is definitely. I mean, it's just not described. So it's it's almost hard to ha it's almost hard to like have a further conversation if we don't really have um, the background of of what was done. So it, it it's difficult yeah. um, to say. And uh, additionally, the way that I read it, and and please 
you know, jump in if I mm-hmm. mis- read this, but it seems like all of these people did get massage before having, like you said, traditional medic- mm-hmm. med- uh, medicine or, or, you know, health visits. So, so it was an unknown, it was basically someone had this report of pain. They went to their massage, their, you know, their massage therapist. Um, I have this pain here and the massage therapist directed massage therapy. They called it massage manipulation. So I'll use that term Mm -hmm. um, to the site of where the pain was, which then was discovered was osteosarcoma. Yeah. Um, And I think, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Erica. No, go ahead. You know, and I think till you brought up an important point where they talked about that people who gravitated towards the complementary forms of care versus traditional medicine, maybe there was. When do we say sorry? Just just on terms by traditional, you're meaning Western, because in the study they're using traditional, (laughs) traditional Indonesian. Yeah, yeah. So you know, more allopathic, you know, mainstream medical kind of approaches. So we, you know, I think we all know that staging is an important component in potential for, you know, metastases as well. So perhaps, you know, was that looked at in the study? So at what point were these individuals who had previously had massage, what was their staging? And was that different than, say, the ones who, you know, more quickly went in for uh, mainstream medical diagnosis or evaluation? Mm-hmm. I think the other tricky part that I found in this too were were how many massage they called it massage frequency, but actually I think it was how many massages. They, I think that's what they meant to say is how many massages did these people get, and it was something like I think less than three, so one or two. You could I don't qualify for the study with, with one or two massages. That's right. One or yeah. two massages, yeah. Um, yeah. At, at, and then there was the three and over. Um, so it could be 25 massages. It could be four massages. I, you know, we don't know, um, and we don't know the f- frequency or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the sort of the timeline of this. Um, I mean, there are definitely things that made it a little murkier um, and a, a little a little harder to follow in that sense of like, okay. Um, and also, I think too, you know, I think what what the researchers did with, um, you know, the, the osteosarcomas that they studied, these folks had a, um, you know, a they were high grade osteosarcomas, so they had like a higher rate of metastases. And I think they did that to to keep, you know, just to kind of keep some of the um confusion out of it, right? You don't want some that are high risk, some that are low risk. They were all high risk. Standardized um, for that factor, yeah. Yeah, but it but it it does, you know, in my mind, it sort of is like, oh, that's an interesting point, right? You know, they were they they had a high risk of metastasis anyway. Yes, it does appear that this group, people that did receive massage therapy, did have metastases earlier um, than these other folks. Um, but I, mm-hmm. I think it, I, I think in in effort to make it less confusing, there was sort of a muddling of of you know what happens there. And so then again, it's like, okay, well, what really was the process that happened? What was the thing that you know? We're guessing. We're guessing a lot of things here. And I did actually reach out through my source, which was Indonesian, to see if I could get in touch with the researchers and wasn't able to there. Because I would be very interested to hear more about it because these unknowns uh, mean we can't really uh, get too nitty gritty about it. But there's a concern there for me personally. There's a concern that the people that sought unspecified massage therapy for their pain before they perhaps knew it was cancer had worse outcomes. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that says to me, uh, we shouldn't be just poking on things because it's painful if there's a chance that it's malignant. Is that a fair concern, fair takeaway? Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's a really hard question. And But but something, again, that the, I think the profession as a whole needs to consider, um, perhaps. I mean, I think, you know, if I have pain and it feels to me maybe like a, a musculoskeletal pain, I will probably see my massage therapist, you know, um, for mm-hmm. that pain. Um, mm-hmm. I I probably won't, my first line might not be to go to my primary care physician. Um, and I think we have a lot of those people that come through our doors, right? Um, and I think uh, too, there, the, to me, there's a little bit of a, you know, the dichotomy of like the, you know, there's a 
there's the people that have a history of cancer that come in with new reports of pain. That to me is like a little bit more of a red flag, right? And then there's people that don't have a history um, who come in and have reports of new pain. Um, I mean, I think some of the questions that we, you know, that we talk about in, in our course, for example, are, you know, again, get sort of granular, like tell me what that kind of pain was. Is it explainable by anything? Is it getting worse, not better? Um, do you have nervy symptoms with this or even motor functions, you know, symptoms with this? Um, and, you know, the more Which sort would of, be red flags for you to, to refer for an evaluation? Is that what those uh -huh. are? Yeah, absolutely. Especially if there's, um, again, because I work with, I work almost solely with cancer populations. So I, my, my view is sort of like if someone has a history of cancer and they're reporting these things, um, yeah. yeah, all the flags go up and you say, yeah, I really think you need to talk to your doctor before we go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. you need to get this checked out. What can um, you tell us about things our listeners should be aware of in working with a random population? What are things that might cause them to refer for uh, potential screening in that sense? Yeah, and I think that's harder in some ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think some of the same questions apply. The, the not getting better, um, mm -hmm. not improving thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, pain tends to have some kind of arc, right? Um, especially if they are receiving massage therapy or other interventions, there usually is some kind of improvement that you see. If there's not getting better, that's a that's a red flag for me, at least to just say, you know, gee, um, you've been working with this thing and it seems like you're still struggling with it. I wonder if this is the time you need to, you know, talk to your doctor about that. Um, you know, I, it is hard. I mean, I think that one gift we can certainly give to our clients and patients is, uh, you know, a, a referral of some kind, either to, you know, to their back to their medical professional or whatever. I mean, I think, um, you know, I was always taught to have a, a wide, you know, I, I use the word Rolodex still, right? <laughs> like have mm -hmm. a wide Rolodex of referral mm -hmm. options. I realize referral there's base. no Rolodexes mm -hmm. anymore, but, <laughs> but, you know, having, having referral sources. So, um, you know, not to zoom out too much, but, um, but it's sort of part of the same question. And I think, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, regular clinical information that we have. And then there's a little bit of a gut check um, of you know, it's just starting to sound maybe not right. Something something else is going on here. This is what we say to ourselves. Yeah. Your work, just to rewind a little bit, your wording to the client was really helpful. You've been struggling yep. with this for a while. I wonder if it's not time to have it checked out by a doctor. Mm -hmm. Something like along those lines can be really helpful. Just didn't have the script or the words to say. Kathy, anything to add here? No, I just, you know, I think it would be um, almost impossible in an initial um, interaction, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a patient or a client to discern if their, pa their pain has some more complex component to it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think Erica brought up a good point about, you know, that importance of looking at the big picture you know, taking a thorough health history, whether or not they have some history of cancer, um, just the contact, the quality or the characteristics of their pain. Um, was there any kind of event that happened that they can link to how this issue started or related to their occupation, some kind of, you know, uh, repetitive or positional kind of issue? All of those questions, I think, are really informative for us um, in, in helping to try to figure out you know, is it safe for me to proceed? Or in what manner should I perceive that couldn't be safe for this individual? So perhaps on a first session, we don't go in with the elbow right into a painful spot. You know, perhaps we start with something a little bit more conservative to see how the person's body responds to that. And as we continue to gather more information. Yeah, I was just going to ask in terms of like trying to make some of those initial decisions. I'm curious from both of your experiences and working with a lot of people um, having cancer, because this is not my area of specialty by any means. If if the person does not have a characteristic pattern of something that would tend to indicate a musculoskeletal problem, the standard kinds of thing that most massage therapists would run, run across, like the, the kinds of things like when you do a, a particular active motion test or a passive motion test that would likely make a musculoskeletal complaint 
get more aggravated or not get aggravated. And if you don't see those patterns and the pain that they're having is outside those patterns, but maybe persistent or something like that, does that then increase your likelihood of thinking along the lines of now got to think more about systemic kinds of issues or something like that that might at that point really increase my awareness and perception about the possibility of something like that being there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah think that, it, I think that's a good point too. A good addition is is that it doesn't follow patterns that you typically see mm -hmm. with, you know, muscular dysfunction or, or tension related, you know. And we, and we see other examples of this in practice too. You know, I can relate it to experience in my practice where I had a client come in who, when they called me, said, I believe I have plantar fascial thing going on or a tendonitis thing. My doctor wants me to come and see you. The person comes in and, you know, I'm looking at both of their legs and I can see in the leg that the person is having the difficulty with um, edema from the knee down, which very much to me was like, uh, blood clot, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because it had all the indicators. It just didn't follow the typical pattern of what I know a tendinopathy or a plantar fascial issue to be, you know. And that's the moment when I say to the person, "You know what? It's not really fitting the profile of what I what I think, you know, is indicated is going on here." My suggestion to you is to go to emerge um, mm -hmm. and tell them that, you know, my massage therapist thinks maybe there's a possibility of a blood clot because there were other things that person's age and other things on their health history that kind of fit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we see a lot of examples of this in practice that we have to be mindful. Is this fitting the typical profile of what we would normally expect in the context of a, a musculoskeletal myofascial kind of thing? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Good point. I was going to say, I know with my wife, when she has uh, you know she, years of working on her, my N of one in my own personal study here, it's, uh, I know that I'm uh, more reluctant to do deep, focused work on the places that hurt, knowing that she has active metastasis as part of her cancer journey at this point. And that feels appropriate. It feels right to both of us. And yet the touch and the work she gets both from me and from other caregivers is such an important part of her ongoing process that I can't imagine leaving that out completely. It's more like uh, incumbent on me to learn how to work with her within the realms of what feels safe. So that's part of this conversation today with you all as well. I actually love what you, I, I feel like what you just talked about was a partnership with your, I'll call her your client. I know she's your wife, but, yes. <laughs> but with your client or patient, which Again, it's it's um, I mean, we talk a lot about partnership in you know at the clinic where I work with. Yes, we have a certain expertise and we know when not to do things or when we things are indicated or things like that. But but it's it's a conversation, you know. It's always a conversation because it's even possible if they're going through chemotherapy and they had a massage that the massage you gave may have been a little bit too much for them that day. You know, it's like okay, well, let's timestamp this. All right, this was two days after your chemo. Okay, so next time, you know, so it's this constant feedback loop, and and it's so nice that you have sort of continuity of care with your wife. To like you said, this study of one, but I mean, it's I'm sure you've seen a lot um, of change over time mm -hmm. with her, and, and mm -hmm. I think it's important to have the communication piece there with our clients. Well, I think to me, for me, this kind of you know fits with, you know, what is critical thinking. And for me, it is that intersex intersectionality of the three pillars of evidence-informed practice, which is science and research, clinician experience, and patient values and input. You know, and, and I think, Till, I think you just beautifully framed that. Thanks for the conversation today. What thoughts would you like to leave us with? Erica? So many, but <laughs> no, I, I, I'm very appreciative of this conversation because it is true. Like we do sometimes have to go back to um, maybe some things that we thought we were done with, right? Or or we've moved on from. But but um, I, as I said before, I think that looking at any sort of new piece of information that comes out is almost the same as a as a, a patient, you know, tomorrow asking me. Is it's are you going to spread my cancer by doing a massage? And I, so I feel like 
the I want to um, sort of um, as an oncology massage therapist, we don't take risks with our patients. Mm -hmm. We're actually quite a careful bunch, usually, mm -hmm. right? And um, and I think it's really important to, in some ways, continue to have this conversation because it, it validates where um, where we came from, but where we are now, and how the conversation has shifted. And I think, um, you know, and and kind of going back to to what we know is true. And um, and yeah, I th I think it's I think it's important to continue to have these conversations every now and then, right? <laughs> As mm -hmm. we do. Our I mean, yeah. you kind of get in the weeds a little bit. It's kind of good to zoom out and see what the rest of the world thinks about what we're doing. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, Kathy, right. what, what would you like to leave us with? Well, and it, it, always my gratitude to the both of you for, you, you know, your willingness to engage in these thoughtful, informed conversations, because I think that really helps all of us to grow as practitioners. And I just think you're doing such a great service to the profession by doing this. So first and foremost, thank you for that. And, and again, I just think that, you know, research helps us to ask better questions. And I think that these two pieces of research really prompt us to ask better questions, you know, and to, to look at the design of research and get more detailed questions so that we can be um, both safe and effective in the care that we are providing for our patients. Mm. Kathy. Wonderful. So we've we've mentioned a couple of resources along the way. Any that you want to highlight for listeners who want to go learn more about this topic or in particular about what you're doing? What resources do you want to name here on our way out? Well, I think um, Kathy mentioned the Society for Oncology Massage, which mm -hmm. is s the number 4om.org. That's a good resource for both for patients and massage therapists and educators. Um, mm -hmm. Tracy actually has tracywalton.com. You can go to her website. She actually still has this incredibly uh, huge bibliography of some really um, interesting um, research and clinical papers. Um, and I think that would be a good thing for people to to check out. Hey, Kathy? And I'll just add to that um, Heal Well, which is an organization that I have a relationship with in the U.S. They are one mm -hmm. of the oncology and hospital-based uh, massage therapy educators. Um, lots of information available through Heal Well. Um, well I have disclosure, a they've been a sponsor of our podcast as well, so <laughs> we, we believe in their work as well. Yeah, and uh, I have a colleague here in yeah. Canada, Erin Price, who has a fabulous website called the mastectomy guide where she provides information for both patients and practitioners. And um, I do, you will find me if you're interested in any of the courses that I teach. Uh, Heal Well brings me into various parts of the U.S. to teach uh, a scar tissue course, which is mindful of the oncology component. It's not mm -hmm. oncology specific. Um, and then as well, I do a collaboration course with Aaron called the science of scar tissue, which again has a a mastectomy and gender affirming top surgery kind of emphasis on it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, how would people get in touch with you, Erica, if they wanted to reach out to you personally? Um, yeah, it would probably actually just be my good old email address, which I'm happy to leave for you, and you can put it in the in the notes. We'll do that. We'll do. That. Yeah, thank you. And Kathy, we'll put some direct contact info for you in there as well. Thank you again, Whitney. Thanks for hanging out with me on this. I'll do yeah. our sponsor, our ending sponsor. The Thinking Practitioner Podcast is supported by ABMP Associated Bodywork and Massage Professionals. ABMP membership gives professional practitioners like you a package, including individual liability insurance, free continuing education and quick reference apps, online scheduling and payments with Pocket Suite, and much more. And ABMP CE courses, podcast, and massage and bodywork magazine always feature expert voices and new perspectives in the profession, including from Till and myself. Thinking practitioner listeners can save on joining ABMP at abmp.com slash thinking. So thanks again to all of our listeners, to all of you all and our sponsors. If you would like, stop by our sites for show notes and videos. Uh, you can get uh, transcripts and all kinds of extras there. You can find that over on my site at academyofclinicalmassage.com. And Till, where can they find that for you? 
advanced dash trainings.com if you have mm-hmm. comments uh, for our guests or for us or things you'd like to hear us talk about on the show, just record a short voice memo on your phone and email it to us at info at thethinkingpractitioner.com. Regular emails are accepted as well. Or look for us on social media. I am at Till Luca, my name. Whitney, what's your name? Today, uh, my name is Whitney Lowe. You can find me on social that way as well. And if you would like, uh, or actually if we would like, we would like for you to rate us on Apple Podcasts as it helps other people find the show. And you can hear us on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever else you happen to listen. So please do share the word, tell a friend, and thank you again, Kathy and Erica, for joining us today. It's wonderful to have this conversation with you both. Thank you.